Welcome to the Tea Grannies. I'm Elise. And I'm Maria. Today we're here with a deep dive into self-publishing, so pour yourself a cup of tea and let's get started. My father always had a quote ready whenever I came to him with a problem. A maddening habit, particularly since he used them instead of solutions for my childish problems. If I came to him, jealous of a friend, he would have, oh, what a bitter thing it is to look into happiness through another man's eyes, ready for me from William Shakespeare. When frustration got the better of me during our shooting lessons, he would quote Goethe and say, everything is hard before it's easy. And when I complained about chores, it was a quote from William Penn that went, patience and diligence like faith remove mountains. I would just roll my eyes back then, but it didn't take long after starting work at Upton's laundry service that I started quoting that last one to myself. By then, my hands were already so raw from the lye soap and hot water that I would have quit if I hadn't needed the money so badly. The work certainly deepened my appreciation for everything our housekeeper, Mrs. Hayhurst, did. What would she say now if she saw me scrubbing other people's laundry? Patience and diligence... I muttered, and bent to attack a stained linen with a stiff brush. "'Wouldn't it be nice if we all had a little more of that?' Mrs. Upton's voice startled me so that I nearly dropped my work. With an apologetic smile, she beckoned me over to a far corner of the Yellowstone courtyard of the laundry. "'Come. We need to talk.' As the other women working beside me in the steam-filled air stopped chattering to watch us walk away in silence, my heart sank. So far, the Uptons hadn't found much cause to reprimand my work but perhaps there were complaints from customers about shrunken silks or torn lace. "'Camilla, there are two men up front asking for you,' Mrs. Upton said, and pulled me into the storeroom out of sight of the others. I blinked. "'What? Who?' They didn't say, but one of them, a very tall man with a right nasty look in his eye, gave me a real fright. She peered at me with narrowed eyes, her mouth twisted in speculation. "'You're not in some sort of trouble, are you? I don't need any of that in my shop.' I, I don't know, I admitted, edging away from the door. No one should know where I am. Well, whatever they got planned, I can't see no good coming from it. Her frown deepened, and in a rush, she pushed me through another door, out into the alley between her laundry and the grocer next door. They got that red horse of yours tied out front, so don't go back wherever you're staying, okay? Come back here in a few days and I'll settle your pay. So my overall comments are, I think this has a lot of promise, but I do think that the first page lacks some intensity. I'm not saying we need like a shootout or something like that, but I'd like to see a little more anxiety from our main character and a little more mm. urgency to her learning that someone is after her. Uh, and I think that can be accomplished by cutting some of the words in the first paragraph where she speaks about her father and then bulk up the reactions when Mrs. Upton pulls her aside. I think then it would it would flow even better. Um, I loved a lot of the descriptions, like attack a, a stained linen with a stiff brush and like the steam filled air. I thought those were really, really nice. Um, and it could just be the style of the character's speech or like the time period. Cause I'm getting kind of like, I don't know how else to describe this, like Western mm -hmm. wild West mm -hmm. vibes from this. Uh, but the red horse would refer to like chestnut horse, which is a reddish brown color. So if you wanted to be totally correct about it, you would say chestnut horse or your chestnut outside or whatever. Um, but yeah, and then as far as some of my specific comments, one of the thoughts I had about trimming that first paragraph was to uh, cut one of the quotes so that there's only two. I think that would free up some space and still really get the point across. Um, when she says, a uh, very tall man with a right nasty look in his eye gave me a real fright. So she describes how he gave her a fright, which would help describe him as well. But it, it doesn't give him any physical descriptors that help him stand out. Like, right nasty look in his eye. I mean, sometimes, like, people probably say that I look, like, right nasty sometimes. <laughs> and I'm really just, like, rusty bitch face. <laughs> so I think, like, an actual physical descriptor there would would do <laughs> would really help with like the sure. feeling <laughs> you know I rest your bitch face you know it <laughs> it's so bad uh, but yeah and then a little further down where they're talking about she's got the horse tied up up front and don't go back to wherever you're staying 
like Mrs. Upton's pretty chill about someone coming after one of her staff, actually. Like, oh yeah, don't worry, don't come back, you know, I'll pay you. <laughs> so <laughs> I think that that kind of goes with the tone of it being a Western where like when people were wanted, they kind of had to like get, you know, get out of Dodge. So, but the other actual reason I stopped and bumped on this was because I think we could get a little bit more intensity right there as well. Like, why does no one know um, that they're coming after her? Why, like, why is she so afraid? We don't need the whole explanation because I feel like mm -hmm. that's going to be one of the driving factors here. But like a little bit, just so we have enough that we will like turn the page and be like, oh, why? Um, and then I think we could use another beat here where she says, no one should know where I am. And then Mrs. Upton's like pretty chill about it. I think that's a pretty big bomb to drop. Mm -hmm. uh, like no one should know where I am. Like, mm -hmm. and if she's been keeping her identity pretty quiet, then Mrs. Upton's response should be like, what do you mean? No one should know where you yeah. are. Like it should be just a little bit more intense, but I did like, I love so much about this and all of these suggestions are to like, make it just like a little more intense, but I, I really, really enjoyed this one. Yeah. Most of my comments kind of reflect the same, same feeling. I was just looking for more I was looking for that intensity, the tension, just to amp that up a little bit more because it's, it's a super intriguing start. Um, and we mm -hmm. already, like, we learn a lot within the first page that makes us interested in the main character and whatever it is she's going through. Because from the opening quotes with her father and then the mention of a housekeeper, we learn that she probably came from some kind of wealthy household. Um, and now she's working doing laundry for other people. So that seems like, well, fall from grace or like she's her life is really messed up or something happened and she's on the run and um all the pieces are there kind of in the background but I don't think we get quite enough hints toward the details um and like Maria said I don't think we need the whole story because that would be too much too much of an info dump too much up front um having the intrigue and the suspense of finding out what happened is part of what drives the story forward for sure um but I'd love to see just a touch more of that here um to build that suspense and keep us a little bit more on the edge of our seat, I guess, because it's so promising. It's it's all right there. Like, I love mm -hmm. the descriptions. I loved the voices of the characters, um, the setting, the the word choice in certain areas about the grocer. And yeah, it just, it's a very polished first page. It's very interesting. Um, and I would definitely read more as is, but just adding that extra punch that seems to be missing here to ramp up the tension, I think would... Mm -hmm. um, would just add just that oomph and make it really, really shine. So what goes into self-publishing? Self-doubt, tears, screaming, all of those, I suspect. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, before we jump into the episode, we are operating under the assumption that your manuscript is as ready as it possibly can be mm -hmm. for publishing before you go into these next steps. Mm -hmm. And by that, if you are just tuning into this episode and you haven't heard me rant for like three seasons, <laughs> um, <laughs> your manuscript should be ready as possible, which means multiple drafts, you've edited, you've had beta readers get feedback, you've edited some more, it's as polished as it can be. Mm -hmm before you hit these next steps. And, you know, I'm not trying to be cruel, but if you have not, if you've just finished your first draft, you are not ready to self-publish. Mm. Just like you're not ready to query after you finish the first draft, mm -hmm. even if it's the best thing ever. You're just not ready. And just, just trust us, like take a couple months off and come back to that manuscript and be like, oh yeah, they were right. <laughs> this is not so hot. So what editing is for. So... We're going to get into what you have to do to put your book together for self-publishing. And I'm going to let Elise take the wheel on this one. Woohoo. Okay. Mm. Mostly just because I've just gone through the experiment of self-publishing some ebooks. Um, so I guess that's my disclaimer up front. I have self-published ebooks. I haven't done print books. So we're going to, you know, muddle our way through what we can um, and figure out more details on that later. But if you're here for print book information, on for that yeah. purpose, so yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> We're going to interview the heck out of some people. They're going to be really annoyed with us and it's going to be wonderful. Um, it's going to be great. Yeah. No, they're going to love this. It's going to be good. We're cute. So <clears throat> preparation is step 
one of this episode of the self-publishing deep dive. Um, all the things you need to know, knew you never wanted to know, have come here to know, will regret knowing, and then you'll just take it and run with it because that's how we do. So you'll be happy in the end. I promise. Is that like an abusive line? Like I'm, it's <laughs> gonna be hurt, happy but, when it's but over. it's for your own good. Like that's not very nice. Um, <laughs> It's like the whole dentist thing I was just talking about. Yeah. You're not going to enjoy it, but you're going to be glad with it. It's, it's going to be good for you. Trust, just trust yeah. me. <laughs> All right. So once you have your manuscript where it needs to be, like Maria said, um, you need a title. If you're the kind of person that waits till the end to pick a title, I respect that. That's what I do. Yeah. Self-control. I can't oh, do yeah. that. They get named right away. <laughs> <laughs> or that they at least have a stupid name right away. Well, yes. You need yeah. a stand-in title. And then yeah. chances are you get too attached to that one and can't refer to it by any other name, which is yes. what happens to me because I'm one of those people that chooses a title at the end. So my draft bug babies, do I need a title babies. for that? Well, I, Ho Hall of Hades did get a title in the end, but it, it did, did take me some time. But I still call it Hall of Hades. Like, <laughs> me too. <laughs> <laughs> See what I mean? <laughs> so I guess, yeah, if you choose a title early kudos to you mm -hmm. um but get that title in there one way or another and write your back cover copy even if you're not printing copies physically of these books you need um that copy that you will put on um on websites to describe what the book is about without giving away any spoilers um and then i like to write a shortened version so a log line or elevator pitch that's one or two sentences long uh based on that back cover copy and that's just for shorter pitches for social media posts um and for other applications where you don't have as much word count word space and just want to get a quick vibe across it can be it can be a lot more effective honestly than a full summary because we're all chasing the vibes so and we want immediate yeah. gratification, so yeah. if you can read it in one sentence, you're like, oh, yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> it's mine. Want to read. Yes. Uh, yeah. So finalize your title, write your back cover copy, write your log line, and choose a publishing date. And that may feel daunting. Uh, just remember that you're setting the deadline for yourself. So all that pressure that you feel like has to be there, it's not real. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but also <laughs> setting that deadline should help you get your rear end gear and get it done if you're anything like us yeah. essentially those deadlines push you along to the finish line so um when you're considering your publishing date um the biggest thing you'll want to keep in mind is that every single step along the way the steps that we're going to talk about in this episode they all take time um so set your expectations in the right place for this. Don't expect to have your cover design banged out in a week um, unless you hire someone on Fiverr who's just a god. Um, again, kudos to you. But no, don't, I don't, I would say don't go into it expecting that to happen. If it happens, you know, you have, you have three weeks off. Great, because you planned for this. Um, don't expect proofing to take 14 days and no weekends. Um, even if you're doing it yourself, don't do that to yourself. Um mm -hmm. Speaking relatively recent experience of proofing back to back to copy editing, back to back to developmental editing, just don't do that. Um, give yourself time because you're not, you might feel like you're in a rush to get this thing out in the world and there's, there's an aspect of that certainly, but if it comes out now versus six months from now versus 18 months from now, it's, it really doesn't make that big of a difference um, unless there's something exceptionally timely happening in the world for fantasy writers for sci-fi like maybe but i doubt it i honestly doubt it mm -hmm. so you know don't worry about it too much um but plan yourself months in advance because anytime you're working with other people whether it's cover design interior design layout um or editing uh you're going to run into snags you're going to have communication issues um you're going to have to reevaluate and you don't want to have to keep pushing back your date because you didn't give yourself enough time in the first place you didn't give your freelancers enough time in the first place um yeah give yourself time so that you have space to breathe um and then before you can move beyond the planning and preparation stage know what you're trying to do know what your goals are know what you're aiming for are you only doing ebooks that was me. So I had, you know, I had a breather on all the other stuff because I didn't have to prep the the print versions. Um, 
Do you have audiobooks to consider? Are you doing hardcovers as well as paperbacks? Um, are there other goodies that you want to put out along the way, like little bookmarks or things for people who pre-order? Um, that can be a really good way to drum up business. Um, but you need to consider all these things before you get started on everything um, because of all that timing. And when are you going to have time to think about this? Will it be when you've sent your book off to your proofreader and you have a couple of weeks and then you can focus on these other things like being able to sit down and plan all that out is only going to serve you in the long run. Um, but yeah, I think those are all my step, my uh, suggestions for step one. Suggestions? No, they're rules. These are laws. Rules. Laws you must follow. <laughs> and last but not least, a very, very important step in your preparation is setting a budget. Uh, a lot of people dun, dun, don't dun. do this and then they kind of start diving in and go, oh my God, it's so expensive. Yeah, you got to do this part because then you'll know what you can do yourself and what you can hire out for. Mm -hmm. So if you have a hard cap of $500, you know, that's going to limit you. You're going to have to do a lot more yourself. If you've got $5,000, okay, maybe you can get your dream cover. Maybe you can do more paperbacks. But it takes, it makes a big difference in the type of things that you're going to need to do for your self-publishing journey. Um, I'm a budget queen and I like to ignore my own budget. If anybody <laughs> follows me on Bookstagram, you know how that is. <laughs> you see my hauls, it's so bad. So uh, like Lee said, you've got all those steps to do before you even start like eBooks. What, you know, what else do you wanna do with it? What kind of cover you have in mind? So start, start with those then you're gonna make a list and you're gonna start doing some research and decide what you will do yourself versus what you want to hire out for versus mm -hmm. what you'd like to hire out for. Mm -hmm. So there's some things where you're like, I have to hire out for this because I don't know how to do it. And then you have some stuff where you're like, I'd like to hire out for this, but if push comes to shove, I can do it myself. Um, and consider your writing community when you're doing this because you might know someone who's just starting out with copy editing and they're looking for clients. Mm -hmm. You could probably get an intro price based, yeah. you know, instead of a full price. Yeah. Uh, if you have a friend that does cover design, like we do with Maya, who is on one of our recent episodes, well, maybe find out what they would charge. Maybe they'll give you the friends and family discount and see if they, but make sure they can produce the product you want mm -hmm. <laughs> before you agree mm -hmm. to yes. just, just the price. <laughs> <laughs> and then everyone's favorite thing to hear, um, make a spreadsheet. Ooh. I know disgusting but <laughs> <laughs> excel has a lot of downloadable templates that you can use um you can use like if you don't have microsoft office and a lot of people don't you can you, google docs has sheets and then you mm -hmm. can go ahead and make it there don't know what the templates for there but um you can make one it's not super hard you do it it's not too bad and this will help you keep your expenses straight so if you really want to be prepared and you really want to um, decide, you know, what, what you can do yourself and what it would look like if you didn't do a lot of it yourself, you can make multiple, um, tabs of the spreadsheet mm -hmm. and do like one on a shoestring budget, one on like kind of a mid budget, and then one on like your dream budget. And then once you go through these steps and you get some idea of what you want to do and you're done brainstorming all the cover designs and everything like that, you can decide. And that's the other perk of taking your time. Like Elise said, you will probably have more money to spend if you don't rush it. I know if I was going to self-publish right now, I'd be like, well, it's not going to be a very good product because I don't have the money budget and set aside for it. Whereas if I knew in six months I was going to do it, then I'd be able to start putting yeah. money aside for it. So that's something you do have to think about as well. Mm -hmm. I'm very glad you're here. <laughs> because, uh, yeah. I'm not the person to come to for advice on that. So uh, y'all know who to talk to now. Okay. Uh, the next thing we need to get into is a little, little nitty gritty. So I'll try to keep it short, but it is very important. Um, you need an ISBN for your book. And the step applies to, this is step two, ISBNs. Um, the step applies to all formats, whether that's ebook, print book, and that's paperback or hardcover. You'd need two different ones for that or an audiobook. Um, you need an ISBN before you start uploading your book files onto any sites like Kindle Direct Publishing um, or sending stuff to printers. Um, you might not need it right off the bat, but you will need it eventually unless you're only publishing on Amazon and then you can use theirs. They can, they can give you a, a free one on their platforms. Um, 
But I will say I would not recommend that because then if you ever want to move your book off of Amazon, that could get complicated and then you're going to need one anyway. So I recommend just getting one for yourself to get your own ISBN. Don't let Amazon own you that way. Um, and yeah, that's just generally good advice for for life in general. Um, but anyways, in simplest terms, an ISBN is like product number. It's It's a barcode. Uh, when you go into the store and pick up a can of beans, that can has a barcode on it. And if you scan that barcode or the barcode on any of the other identical cans of beans on the shelf, the same product will come up in the computer. And that is what an ISBN is. You need that for books as well. Um, if you're in Canada, you can get ISBNs for free. Please do not pay for ISBNs if you are Canadian. Um, go to the Library and Archives Canada website. We'll put the link in the description. We're going to make this real easy for you because it would be a tragedy if we didn't. Um, and create an account for yourself on their site. You can read through the steps for how to do that. They have help articles. They just walk you right through it. Um, I know it's not very intuitive. I don't find government websites very intuitive most of the time. Um, but it, once you got it set up, it's really easy, um, super quick to just grab an ISBN for your book. You just have to put in a little bit of information about it. You don't even have to know when it's going to be published. Um, you just need to know basically the title and um, a couple other little details, add your name and you've got it. You've got it good. Um, so if you're Canadian, it's easy peasy. Please don't do this wrong because that would be bad, but you can do it. I believe in you. We'll put the link down in the description. If you're not Canadian, I'm very sorry for you, but you have to buy your ISBNs. Um, yeah. yeah. You said I'm very sorry for you. It sounded like you were apologizing for like something else and not for the <laughs> ISBN thing. <laughs> I mean, if you're not Canadian, like I am sorry. It's really <laughs> awesome. I love being Canadian. <laughs> I mean, that works. I should have just stopped there, eh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sorry continue oh, that's yeah. so distracting if you're not today. Canadian I'm sorry for so many things but also you have to buy your ISBNs there we go that's a little mm -hmm. better um I have no experience with this so I can't help you I'm sorry about that I'm being very Canadian right now um yeah we're gonna get in a couple more apologies just to make sure <laughs> we'll get there I'm sure yeah. we'll fill this episode up with a a sorry a um okay but as with any other time when you're researching buying things online Please do your due diligence. Do your research. It's so easy to get scammed online these days. Um, you don't have to be an older person to get scammed online, despite what people may think. You can leave your ageism at the door. It can happen to any of us who are just not paying close enough attention. So check writer forums. Ask your Twitter followers if you're ever in doubt about a site. Um, it's better to be safe than sorry on this. And I mean, you know, worst comes to worst, just send me a DM. I'll help you vet your sites. I really don't want you to get scammed. So I'm I'm open to helping out that way. I really, really, really don't want this to go the wrong way. Um, last couple things about ISBNs because this is getting boring. You will need one different ISBN for each type of publication you intend to put out. So what that means is you need one ISBN for all of your eBooks. It doesn't matter what platforms they're on. If it's on Amazon and Kobo and Google, it's the same ISBN because they're all eBooks. Unless you decide you want to edit and put out a second version or second edition of the book, and then you would need a new ISBN. You need one ISBN for your paperback version. You need one ISBN for your hardback. You need it for your audiobook and I think that's it. But yeah, hopefully that makes sense. Add, yeah. Yeah. How many listen, other listen to Elise people? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, be diligent about this. You got it. You can do it. It'll be fine. Now that's the boring stuff. I think we can move on to other things. <laughs> Step three. Everyone's favorite, least favorite cover design. Probably my favorite. Your favorite. Yeah, I love covers. I'm okay. like obsessed. Should yeah, just give it's, you the section. It's an unhealthy section. <laughs> it's up there. All right, we do buy books by their covers, so mm -hmm. you know, keep that in mind. Um, but here is the deal: despite what you may think, you do not need to blow the bank on this. It really depends what you want. If you want something pretty specific, um, you might end up paying more for it, but. There are enough people out there in the world with enough money to spend shit tons on fancy covers, and good for them. That's great. Um, the, the average person is not one of those people. 
um remember we are we are the rule not the exception (laughs) Yes. <laughs> so um, I am going to link to my personal favorite designer, the fabulous Maya Hampson, in the description. Um, she did all of my covers for the Nymph Keeper series, and I'm very proud of her and very proud of them. And she's a literal saint. So if you're looking for a cover for your book, you can look at her portfolio, link in the description. Um, and everything that she's got there right now is under $200, whether you're looking at USD or Canadian. I believe the site is in USD. Um So it's, you know, really not that bad. Uh, You can also hire people on Fiverr or Upwork or other freelance sites for relatively low cost. And just, again, be extra, 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 extra careful of scams on freelancer sites. Um, And pricing aside for the moment, pay for something you actually like. Like genuinely, you see the product and you're like, no, that's beautiful and I love it and I could stare at it all day. Make sure that that's your reaction because you don't want to have to be changing out your covers every couple months or years because you settled for a design and it was cheap, but it wasn't up to your standards. Um, if you think it's subpar from the get-go, other people will think, think so as well. So, you know, take your time to look at it, put it aside for a few days. I do this to Maya all the time. She probably hates me. Um, <laughs> I'll stare at it for a couple hours. I'll put it aside for like four days and then I'll look at it again. And if that's not enough, I'll, I'll wait another couple days before I get back to her with feedback. So um, give yourself a few weeks and up to a couple of months for this stage. You're, you're going to have to go back and forth with your designer on this, depending on how many tweaks you want to make and whether they understand your initial premise, because trying to describe design in words that another brain will understand is like you're speaking two different languages man it's just it's not it doesn't come naturally um it's going to take time you're going to be picky you're going to try and explain what you want and they're not going to get it they're going to have to guess and they have to try all these different options and yeah it never goes right the first time just go in expecting Mm -hmm. that if it does you know rejoice have a glass of champagne you've got three weeks off like we said um there are exceptions but we are the rule so Mm -hmm. plan to be the rule and not the exception and just go with it. It'll be fine. You'll get something beautiful and you don't have to spend all your life savings on it. Yeah. And this is where it comes in to make sure that you have samples of covers that you like, mm-hmm. covers that make you feel some type of way, mm-hmm. um, covers that you can show the artist or like say, I like, you know, this edition of this popular book. That's the cover I like the best. That's the vibes I want because like artists understand vibes. So you can can definitely say that. (laughs) Don't be that person who's like so wishy-washy that the designer has no idea where to start. You have to give them somewhere to start so that they can give you some options and then you can work from there. So if you like the font on one cover and the colors on another and the vibe of another, send them all to the cover designer, but be specific about what you like about it so that they know what to do next. Um, And yeah, you don't need to break the bank on this, but you will be promoting this book to death and Mm -hmm. you'll want to at least like looking at it. You're going to want to just trust me. And you know, the whole never judge a book by its cover uh, is absolutely bullshit when it actually comes to books because people do judge by the cover. So if you have a fluffy rom-com that you wrote, don't pick a dark and witchy theme for your cover (laughs) like your reader is coming in there with expectations so Mm -hmm. if you wrote a fluffy rom-com give us a fluffy rom-com cover yeah you know if you wrote something like a dark witchy fantasy like give us that black cover with like the cool writing and like Mm -hmm. the vibes Mm -hmm. right so that's something you got to do pinterest is great for this or just browsing the bookstore browsing on your like online websites for books wherever you buy your books um bookstagram is awesome as well for Mm -hmm. this So if you're not on Bookstagram, you should be. (laughs) (laughs) Come join us. Join the dark side. Yes, come to the dark side. We spend a lot of money on books and we keep saying (laughs) that we will not buy more books. I'm on a book ban. Look at my book haul. Yeah, Yeah, I just did that. (laughs) Yeah, it's dangerous, dangerous out there. Danger. All right. So that's cover design. Uh, Believe it or not, there's one more design step that we have to talk about briefly. Um, But the book layout and interior design. Um, Believe it or not, it is necessary for both print and ebook to consider this stage. Um, People usually think that you write the book, you slap it in a word file and get someone to design a pretty cover and you upload them both and you're good to go. But no. Have you ever looked inside a book? Those aren't eight and a half by 11 printer pages. Um, There's specific sizes 
and the text has been formatted and adjusted to fit within the margins of these pages and you can you can hire a specific designer just to do your book interiors like it can be a different person from your cover designer chances are maybe they don't do both i know some designers do both um, but you could hire two different people for those two different things um now, because this hasn't been my experience, I'm just going to focus on what you can do if you don't want to hire someone for this. Uh, this is self-publishing after all. If you're down to do it yourself, you can find a way. Um, so for my ebooks, I experimented with a site called Readsy. They have a book editor tool. Um, it's completely free. It lets you upload, edit, and set up your book with like copyright, title pages, acknowledgements. You've got a dedication page. Like it's just, it gives you all the sections. You just fill in the blanks. Um, whatever the heck you want, whatever the heck you want you can do. You can add different sections and slap it into your final product. And you can use this for ebooks and for print books. Uh, I don't know how well it does going to print because I haven't done that. So, I mean, if an actual designer looked at the finished product, they would probably gag, but the average person is not <laughs> going to notice and they'll think it looks just fine. <laughs> okay. But for, for people who want to be able to customize a lot more and pick their own fonts, um, you can't do that with Readsy. You pick a template from Readsy. They give you like four to choose from. Um, and you decide based on my book, this is the one that suits the vibes. So I would say they have the options that are needed. Um, but if you want to be able to customize that and pick specific things or add like illustrations or cute little icons and pictures to your chapter headings, you need something that's more robust um, and you're probably gonna have to pay for it. So there are tools specifically for book layout or design uh, such as Vellum. Vellum is only for Mac. Um, Atticus. Atticus is for any operating system and is a bit cheaper than Vellum, so you might want to look there first even if you have a Mac. Um, but these are both paid programs. We'll put links in the description as well. Um, Atticus also works on Chromebooks, which is a real kicker because a lot of programs don't. So if you're working with a Chromebook and you just are feeling like nothing works for you, Atticus will work for you. So um, if you're hiring a book layout designer, you shouldn't need to buy software because the designer should have access to it already if they're worth their name. They should not be making you pay for software. So don't get scammed that way. Don't know if it's happened, but it probably has. Um, they'll take care of all the technical stuff. So that's book layout and design. Um, yeah, we can move on from there and move back into something that we're actually a little bit more familiar with. Step five, proofreading. Yay, everyone's favorite. Ah, oh, I want to die. <laughs> oh, yes. Proofreading gets its very own step outside of the editing process from before that we talked about because you've already done all your edits at this point, like we said, before you're even thinking about these things. Um, proofreading is a beast of its own. Um, and so many people get this wrong, so I'm just going to go over it again. Um, this is the last stage of edits that you do on your book after it has been designed and laid out by your designer or your designing program. This should be a PDF so that you see exactly what it will look like in print form or ebook form, however it is going to be published. Um, these edits should not happen in a Word or Google Docs file. You shouldn't be able to just, you know, go in there and erase and add in. That's not how this works. The PDF maintains the proper formatting, and that's very important because you're also looking at spacing and design and making sure that page numbers are where they're supposed to be. Um, and then, of course, if you missed any typos at any of your previous rounds of editing, we want to catch those here. Um, at this point in the process, you're probably sick to, de sick to death of reading your book. Um, that means you've, you've done things right. You hate it now, even though it's wonderful. Um, I, I, I just went through this. <laughs> I recommend hiring this out, even if you did everything else by yourself, um, because of how exhausted you probably are at this point. You're not going to catch everything. I, I know I didn't, and I did this stage myself. It's just, that's just the way it goes after you've looked at something for so long. So I've hired a proofreader off of Readsy. It was a lovely experience. I believe it cost me around $500 Canadian for an 85,000 word book with the person that I chose. Everyone rates are a little bit different, but, and Readsy does take like a little fee, um, but it's not bad. And, and again, there's so many places to hire people for this online. Uh, just be careful, be diligent, beware of scams. Um, if you can stick to editors that you know from your writing groups or editing groups, or like, you know, people that have worked with them and you know, they've had a good experience because it's just really easy to get caught up in sketchy things that don't seem sketchy at first, but then they get sketchy really fast and you lose money and it's terrible. Don't want that to happen. Um, yeah, 
just be careful. If you need a second set of eyes on anything, again, I don't want you to be scammed. Please, even if you're not going coming to me as an editor, even if you know that I edit and you're like, well, I want someone else, that's fine. We might not be a good fit. I am perfectly aware, upfront about that with all my clients. I do like a free sample edit of just a few pages just to make sure that, hey, do you like the style of editing? No, here's some friends that I edit that you might like. Like that's that's how I roll. Um, it's, it's kind of like finding an agent. It's, it's anytime you're working on a business deal with somebody, you want to make sure that you're going to work well together. Uh, that goes for editing as well. So be careful if you think something might be scammy, but you can't tell, just like email me. I will look into it with you. Um, and yeah, check those social media platforms, Google it to see if anyone else has suffered similar scams because that often will turn up right away. Um, yeah. I now give me a big sign with flashing neon lights that says I care about this issue and will die on this hill because I will. So <laughs> that's step five, proofreading. <laughs> be diligent, be careful, get your edits done. And step six, I feel like I've been talking a lot. I'm sorry, um, I have nothing to contribute. I just, wanna, I just have to listen to you talk. Just let you go. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to blitz through this again because this one's not as exciting either, but... Um, Step six is ARC copies. Once you have like all of your book things together, you have this this product that has come together with a cover and it looks beautiful and you're, you hate it and are sick to death of it, but you also love it because it's your baby. Um, now you have to share it with the world. And a really good way to kind of market yourself and get your work out there before you even start selling it is with ARC copies. ARC stands for Advanced Reader Copy. These are typically free books, I think they're always free, that are sent out to select readers before a book gets published. Um, and self-published books do this too. It's on or around the launch date. It can be after the launch date. You can get them after that. That's fine. Um, but these should all should still always be free. Um, and if you're making some of these to send out, you'll want like a line on the cover and possibly a disclaimer in the interior that says the copy is an ARC and not for resale. I just did this like I put my cover into canva.com. It's an online graphic design platform. We'll link to it. Um, added some text onto my cover that kind of fit in with the design a little bit so it didn't look horrible. Um, and if you have a higher designer, they'll probably have experience with doing this in other ways. So don't worry about it. Um, Anyways, oftentimes you receive an ARC from a publisher or author. There's this certain un unspoken or explicit understanding that you're going to leave a review. A lot of people do. If they get an ARC, um, they got a free, co free copy. So, you know, it's kind of give and take. They leave a review. Um, in certain instances, maybe in all instances, it is illegal to request a review from someone that you're giving a free book to. Um, so just be aware of your laws and rights. Do a little research. Do a little Googling. Um, there are a variety of ways to get ARCs out in the world. And I think some people just email ebook copies to their um, to their list of people, either as PDF or EPUB file, files, which can be open on most e-readers. Um, I have used a couple of platforms to do this. Uh, the one that is probably the most well-known is Book Sirens. Um, that's specifically for distributing ARC readers, getting reviews on your books. And there's a, there's a free tier account with some limitations, um, that works if you're just sending to people that you already know. And then they also have, um, paid account tiers that you can choose from if you'd like to get a little more reach. And it just, it greatly increases your chances and definitely gets your book out there. So I, I would say it's never not worth it. Um, and there are other websites, I'm sure, that do this as well, but Book Sirens, again, is reputable. It is, I know people that have used it and have said it's been successful, so that if you're if you're wondering and you don't know anything about it, that'd be a good place to start. Are we supposed to call them ARCs? Because I've been calling them ARCs in my head for like two years. <laughs> Damn it. So I don't I'm just know. Gonna, we're just going to, we're going to keep this in so that, you know, listeners can weigh in on what they call it. I call it <laughs> art, probably because I never say it out loud until this episode. So then you said ARC, so I'm like, oh, that sounds like a lot more correct. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I call, call it an arc. <laughs> I think it probably goes by both. Like I say it ARC because it's easier to then break down the acronym. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm pretty sure I've seen both or heard both in, in social media context. <laughs> yeah, I, I'd be very interested to hear. If I'm, I'm interested to know. Uh, it's one of those classic, classic instances. You know you're a reader when... You've yeah, heard a you've word and you can use word. it in context, but you can't say it properly. Yeah, that yeah. happens to me a lot. Yeah. 
But I did want to add that I didn't mean to go off topic slightly, but the other thing I wanted to add is to try to make sure that you send some of your ARCs to people that you know. Um, I did review Elisa's for Roots of Blood, even though I'd read it like a million times. Um, and I did find a few things that she needed to fix. And I did this for another writer that I know. And I just kept like a little running list of like little typos or like missed commas. Like this isn't the time to be like, uh, why did you do this with this character? Mm -hmm. No, just keep a little list of stuff that might have gotten missed in the proofreading process and then send it to them way before they hit that final publish button. Don't right. wait till like publish day. Be like, hey, I just noticed you're missing a comma uh, <laughs> on every single page. How many times? Do you know <laughs> how period. many times? Like, especially family members and friends. This is just a little side tangent because I have to. When you publish anything, whether it's traditionally or self-published and any of your family or friends read it, if they do so, just expect this to happen, smile and wave and move on. But they're going to come mm -hmm. to you after it's been published and it's out in the world and you cannot yeah. change it. And they're going to say, yeah, I noticed on like a few spots, there were a few things like a missing word, a typo. Yeah. And you're going to pull out your hair and you're going to scream into a pillow that night. And you're going to say, why didn't you just let me live in ignorant bliss? Why did you open yeah, up the matrix for me? Man. Like, how what dare you? What do you want me to do? But it's okay. It's going to happen. People can't help themselves. I think they just, like, people feel really proud when they find a typo in a published book. <laughs> I found a couple of typos in the last couple of months in, in tra traditionally published books. And I was like, aha, it doesn't just <laughs> happen to the self-pub writers. <laughs> yeah, right there. it's just, it happens all the time. <laughs> yeah, it does. But yes, do try and make sure you get a buddy or two um, mm -hmm. that will read it sort of with that in mind yeah, before for you. Publishing. Um, because, again, you've looked at it so many times that your brain is going to start skating over the words and you're going to miss stuff. Okay. Step seven. This is, we're almost, we're almost done. We're, we're getting there. Come on, people. We're almost there, we can make guys. it. We have the product. We've sent it out to people that we love who are going to be nice to us on reviews. No, that's what you're not supposed to do. We sent it out to people to get honest reviews about whether they like it or not. And um, around this step, maybe before that, before you've done that, even maybe after, you need to look at distribution at some point. So what platforms are you going to be selling your book on? It's just going to be Amazon. Are you going to work with Kobo? Are you going to work with Google? If you're doing print books, are you going to work with CreateSpace or Ingram Spark or Lumina Press or BookBaby or Lulu? Or Blur? I could just list platforms for you to consider all day long. I'm not going to do that. We're going to leave you some links, things to check out. You can look up articles that compare the different platforms, their pros and cons. I do that a lot. Um, Readsy is really good for that. They like to put out um, blog posts about comparing different platforms and just gives you a really good insight into what would be work best for you. Um, so obviously your distribution will depend highly on your book formats, whether it's print, ebook, audiobook, or otherwise. Um, but you're gonna need a way to get those books out there, so you need to consider this. Um, and then if you're printing physical copies, you are 100% going to have to pay for the printing, so that's a budget item you can't get away from. Um, but if you're doing ebooks, you can distribute for free. Uh, each site will just take a chunk out of your royalties after the fact, but you never have to pay anything up front, or you shouldn't, because that sounds like a scam, don't do it. So, because I don't have experience with printing physical books, I'm not going to talk about that. Just going to talk about personally. For my ebooks, I chose to publish directly to Amazon, to Google Books, and to Kobo. And then for all the other sites where my books are available, um, like Apple or Overdrive for libraries, I use a platform called Draft to Digital. Um, and so the reason that I divide it this way is because of royalties. You can divide it whatever way you want that makes the most sense for your workflow. Um, but I publish directly to Amazon. Google or Kobo, um, meaning I create an account on each of those platforms and I upload my books separately to each of those and I add in all the information and I set up all the pricing separately three different times for three different platforms. I do this on purpose. I do this to myself. <laughs> yes, it's a circle of hell, but it's one that I'm willing to live through um, because I can get up to 70% royalties on those sites if I do it that way. If I went through draft to digital and just let draft to digital upload to all those sites for me, which is what it's for, it's great for that. Um, draft to digital also takes a cut out of my royalties, so I'm losing more money. Um, and it's relatively easy to set it up on Kindle or those other sites, so I just find like it's, it's worth my time to get those extra royalties by spending the time there and doing it myself. 
Um, but you can absolutely use draft to digital to do it on all those platforms and just take that work off your plate if that makes more sense to you. All right. Here we are. Samwise Gamgee here at the end of all things. Step eight. <laughs> we have marketing. And you can hear the devil laughing in the background. I know you can. <laughs> it's me. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it was like a perfect <laughs> moment. <laughs> oh, man. Doesn't even have to be an evil laugh because you can just feel the evil leeching out of yeah. the word. Um, that's a great start. I know that you're really jazzed to start marketing your books, just like me. Um, but to start, you need it. It's how we make the monies. It's how the world goes round. Um, it's why you have advertisement jingles stuck in your head because someone had a marketing mm -hmm. plan and it worked. Good for them. Marketing is hard. Marketing is complicated. It's confusing. Some people have a natural affinity for it. Some people don't. Um, the same can be said of any other steps we've talked about today. So don't be too daunted by it. It's, it's personally my least favorite part. And once my books are out, it's like, okay, I don't talk about them anymore because they're published. That's all I have to do, right? That's how it works. People will find them and read them on their own if they're good. And if they're bad, then no one will read them, right? Totally. Yeah. <laughs> Let me just burst that bubble right now. If you feel like your books aren't good because people aren't reading them, that's a false equivocation. Like, don't put those things mm -hmm. together in your mind. It's just the market is so saturated and it's really hard to get noticed. Like, that's just a reality. And sometimes yeah. it just flops. And it's not because the book isn't good. Like, there's plenty of books out there that are not mm -hmm. known at all. They're really good books, but they just can't break into the market because of too many ads. Um, and that's the reality of this world that we live in. So yep. don't be too stressed by it. It'll be what it'll be. That's how I approach it anyways. <laughs> but first things first, with marketing, do you have a website? If your answer is no, drop everything. That's your next step. I don't care what stage you're on. Um Go get a website because if you don't have that, that's like your central platform. That's where everything should be leading back to. That's where people are going to go to check up on you. It's the easiest way to do that. For pe like, Some people don't like email. Some people don't like Facebook. Some people don't like Instagram. Some people are only on Snapchat. Um, but if you have a website, everyone can find that. And that's that's kind of the only platform that works that way. Um, and I, don't, I feel like you can't make marketing happen effectively in this current world without a website because it's your hub it's your foundation um, it is your space that you own on the world wide web and you're gonna have to spend some money on this unfortunately there's no way around that either but depending on how you go about it it can be really cheap uh, it can be really easy and we'll link to some more things more links yay mm -hmm. <laughs> you're gonna have we're giving you a lot lots of, of the reading free, material. Yeah, lots of reading <laughs> material. You're all readers, so it'll be fine, right? Um, we're doing some of the legwork for you to find those links, but you do still have to read up yeah. on everything. Um, once you have your website, you can point back to it with your social media, with your different ads. It just becomes this easy place where everything just mm -hmm. lives, and it will make your life easier in the long run. Um, we'll link to a bunch of other sources, uh, other websites for different advertising like i mentioned book sirens already there's other things called like bookbub is a popular book advertising platform um, amazon ads or something to consider social media ads um, google ads readsy discovery is a book review platform for indie authors specifically that i've recently put one of my books on to try it out i'll link to that as well um, you can do giveaways on goodreads you can do giveaways on a platform called Storygraph, which is an alternative to Goodreads that is not owned by Amazon. I'm always just going to plug that a little bit. Um, <laughs> we'll link to that as well. You can get yourself on podcast interviews by literally just reaching out to podcast hosts and being like, hey, mm -hmm. I wrote a book. Would you like to interview me? And yeah, it'll feel a little bit like a cold call and like I'm putting mm -hmm. myself out there and it's uncomfortable and some people will say no or some people won't answer, but some people will say yes. And it's worth it for those ones. So that's a really good way. Um, you can post your book on Wattpad for free if you're just looking for readership and you're just trying to build an audience and you don't care about price right now. Um, we can link to that as well. But it all comes back to your website because all of these different things should link back to you and who you are and your brand and what you're doing um, and, and build off of that. Another thing that I didn't mention yet is email newsletter lists because I hate those too, but... <laughs> 
<laughs> that's another platform that is, you know, it reaches out to more people than Twitter will because some people are on Instagram and not Twitter, but in mm -hmm. order to have an account on either, you have to have an email. So everyone has an email. That's it. That's all I've got to say about this. I hate marketing. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was like waiting. Oh, no, like, I'm lying because I was supposed to say two other things. If you hate this as much as I do, do not fear. There are places to go that can help you. Um, two of my favorite platforms, actually, are the Creative Academy for Writers with our wonderful creative hosts, Eileen, Donna, and Crystal. And they provide all sorts of resources for all stages of writing, but they also have specific community hubs with resources just for publishing and just for marketing. So get yourself an account on there. We'll link how to do that. Um, and that's just a great p place to network and find editors and find book cover designers and people that other people have worked with and not gotten scammed by um, that are reputable. And I'll keep hammering that home. Creative Academy for Writers. And the second one is Mixtus Media will link it's an amazing platform all about helping indie authors market their books that's that's what it's they do awesome. so mm -hmm. they do podcasts they put the transcripts from their podcasts on their website so you can read it instead of listen to it if you're like me and have listening issues um i get <laughs> <laughs> that makes it sound like i have hearing problems no i just have a hard time <laughs> listening to people <laughs> Sometimes I can't, I'm like too overstimulated to listen to people yeah. talk, Yeah, you know, like that's why like audiobooks only really work for me when I'm like driving mm -hmm. or doing something like that. Yep. Because the rest of the time I'm like, I can't listen to someone talk to me right now. I just get distracted so, and then it's like been yeah. two minutes and I'm like, I have no idea what just happened because Yeah, you I completely missed it. <laughs> I don't know how I succeeded in school, but anyway. Um, we made it to the other side of school, it's all that matters. It. Uh, yeah, Mixus Media, I get, I, I'm on their email newsletter list and I get tips from them all the time and they're often very mm -hmm. timely. So I'd recommend signing up for that. And that is all I have to say about this. Yes. I don't have too much to add. We're kind of keeping our marketing segment short because we have some indie authors joining us for the last two episodes and we're going to pick their brain about it. Uh, but I did want to say to consider that each of your social media platforms will require a slightly different approach for your marketing. So like what works on Instagram is not going to work on Twitter. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I haven't, Facebook's kind of, you know, <laughs> your grandma and your aunt will see it. And that's great. <laughs> um, and if you're planning on doing some paid ads, pick pick your platforms, make a budget and give it, give yourself a timeline. So if you're new to paid ads, I would suggest picking like one or two platforms that you feel confident on that you have a following already on and doing a bit of a shorter run and see how you do for the first mm -hmm. time. Like we did a little paid ad for our show for season three on Instagram and it wasn't very expensive. I think we ran it for like a month. It was just kind of an experiment yeah. and it made a difference. It really helped our downloads and that. So we probably do it again. Uh, but if we'd had the opposite data, then we, we would have tried mm -hmm. another platform or would have reworked our strategy in the ad itself. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the thing also to consider. And that's the tea on self-publishing. Don't forget to rate and review us wherever you get your podcasts and follow us on Instagram at the Tea Grannies podcast and on Twitter at the Tea Grannies. All links discussed in this episode will be in the show notes and we'll see you next time for a chat with indie romance author Kate McWilliams. Happy writing. <laughs>